Well, my mother was mortified that I was leaving a proper job to go work for this guy, <laughs> Dom, that she'd never, who was working in that office with right. one desk. Yeah. Um, so, you know, slightly sceptical because I think at that time, nobody's parents understood this industry. It's only now that this is so much of an industry that it's, so it's legitimized. I, I just thought it was interesting. I thought it was more interesting than what I was doing. I wasn't particularly loving the job that I was in. And I thought it's a bit of a punt, but... I think that there's something in this and I think it will grow. In this episode, we talk with Gleam Features Head of Talent, Lucy Loveridge. For the last seven years, Lucy has been a liaison for social media influencers and brands. As Head of Talent of the UK's top influencer agency, Lucy manages big names like Tana Burr. Lucy is also known to be on the polls of what's next for influencers. This is Creative Disruption, the intersection where entertainment, data, and creativity meet. Here's your host, Ricky Ray Butler and Daryl Leaves. Well, welcome back to the Creative Disruption Podcast, where we talk about everything that's disrupting the industry and people that are actually doing it. And I'm joined here by my friend, Ricky Ray Butler. How are you, Hey, Daryl. I'm doing great. How now, are you we, doing? we are here in the UK. Yep. And your last name is Butler. Did you come from here? <laughs> you know that's true, man. So do you want to talk Wait, about classism? No, there is. There's a story to this, right? Um, yes. No, my family was actually from Wells. Okay. Well, that's just and, up the road, and right? And they, you know, went up to um, London and shipped to the U.S. However, you know, there's a variety of ways that you can make fun of my last name. <laughs> I, I, and, and, and in the States, I'd say they're less classy about it. But I came... Um, to a party here in London. It was actually at, it was like it was several years ago, and it was the rugby team captain of the UK rugby team. And there was a lot of different people there, a lot of classy people, I guess what you'd call the, the English elite. The upper class. And, and once people got a little tipsy after drinking for a little bit, it was the first time my last name was ever made fun of for the meaning. And um, two different people are just like joking and saying, oh, you're probably good at cleaning shoes. And I was just like, whoa, I have, I have never heard any type of criticism around my last name when it came to like, you know, classism. It, it, so it's okay. I, I thought like, it was funny. Like here, like eaves, eavesdropper. That's what I, that's what I get known oh, for. Oh, that here. makes sense. So, but it's E-A-V-E-S here. In oh, the it's in your DNA for sure. <laughs> You're oh, 100%. Like you're, all, you're my, so all my ancestors are from here, from Germany. <laughs> That's just the way it is. Well, in Scotland, too. I guess yeah. Okay. No, I, ha- I have a lot of um, UK blood. Do you um, really? According to my DNA test. Yeah. Well, I think we should get right to it because we're sure. here at VidCon in the UK. We have an audience that's out there yes. that's just waiting for us to get on topic of your hand. <laughs> so get right to it. Why don't you yeah. jump right in? So the UK has a lot of rich history when it comes to the creator community, Absolutely. specifically starting with like YouTube. Um, they've always had some of the largest um, talent and the la- largest creators. And I, I remember, you know, like, I, like four or five years ago, I used to call it the British invasion. Whenever <laughs> YouTubers or creators from the UK came to LA, there's just people screaming and freaking out when they saw them. It's the accent, though, yeah. right? No, yeah, there's, it was one of those things where, you know, a, a lot of different people imagined that they had, you know, online boyfriends or girlfriends that were big YouTube stars. I think yeah, it, I, it was a very personal relationship they felt like they had. And um, I started working in the UK and working with creators here about, around nine, ten years ago. And I went to an event called Summer in the City. And it was just a bunch of creators getting together and, and, and hanging out. And there ended up like being lots of people that showed up and a bunch of creators almost got trampled. Um, it was actually very chaotic. And I it, realized it like, sounds like an influencer. Thing. Yeah. But I realized <laughs> that, oh, wow, the, the UK was really growing. And during that time, I, I met a manager um, who was, I would say probably the first manager in the UK when it came to YouTubers and creators. Hmm. And his name was um, Dominic Smalls, or I call him Dom. You, and you, you come Smalls? Um, <laughs> no, <laughs> I don't. But um, I remember, like, you know, we used to just chat over the, I mean, over email and like we do phone calls right. or Skype. And he invited me over to his office, and his office was just, you know, a desk and a chair in a back corner sharing one room with like eight different people. <laughs> and they were not a part total, of the same total company. Startup, yeah. yeah, it was just him. And he had like a bunch of like beauty products on his <laughs> desk. And he was representing 
Pixie Woo at the time. What? And, um, Are you serious? You remember Pixie yeah. Woo? Yeah. Which, I mean, that's blast from the past. One of the biggest, you know, um, beauty creators at the time. And then Pixie Tuu, which is um, Tanya Burr. Yeah, yeah. And who we have with us today is actually um, one of the first. Well, actually, it was the first employee, um, employee? Of, of Dom's company, <laughs> um, Gleam Futures. Um, we're very lucky to have Lucy Leverage hey, here how are you, with us. Lucy? Hi, I'm good. Thank you. Thank you for having me. <laughs> Thank you for coming. Yeah, yeah, and I mean, putting up with Ricky. Oh, yes, like sometimes yes. it gets really bad. He's a delight. He's a delight. And he's, oh, my gosh. He's so much. Hey, you're so proper. Well, look, <laughs> look, look. We worked with each other for years. And um, oh. you're kind of like the stranger on the stage, so stop, you know, trying to deal with it. Why didn't you like set me in the middle then? Because <laughs> you always want to do the intro. You oh. don't, you don't no, let me you, do it anymore. You just like call the center of attention. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so, so Lucy, tell us a little bit about, I mean, from your perspective, your story of coming into the community. Like, how did you meet Dom? And then how did you get started? Um, oh, okay. So I actually met Dom at a party. Oh, um, wow. I had a blog of my own, um, which I'm not proud of. It doesn't exist anymore. Um, but it was in the fashion and beauty space. Do and tell what it is, because like, we can go back on the internet. No, no, it's, it's long gone. It's long gone. <laughs> it's one of those things that we do not want. I promise you, not good. Um, <laughs> but I had a blog. Um, I was, I'd done history at university, not that interested in history, actually, um, and then went into advertising. So I was working in ad agencies, um, doing retail advertising um, and shopper marketing. Um, and did this blog on the side because I saw talent like Pixie Woo and Tanya Burr. I yeah. thought, oh, that looks fun. Thinking, this is just a creative outlet. How enjoyable. Yeah. Started the blog. Then Dom reached out and started sending me shampoo. It was very exciting. Oh, wow. um, and that's how we started our relationship. It was He would send me stuff to... It's a very awkward gift. Hey, here's some shampoo. And, and I wasn't living in London. It always ended up in a box all <laughs> everywhere. Horrible. But that's how we started our relationship, I guess. And So he was sending you business or like doing PR. Yeah. Sending but, you product. But that's where Gleam really started was mm. Dom um, founded the company as a digital brand consultancy, really. Mm. So connecting brands with online audiences and it, that's what he was doing he was talking to Avon and Chanel and Unilever about how to connect with bloggers at the time mm. um so he was doing loads of that stuff and that's how we got to know each other I moved to London he invited me to one of the launch parties for one of the beauty brands where the lean machines were so the lean machines are part of the Chapman uh, clan yes. that Pixie Wu and um, Tanya at the time were part of um, and we got talking and I quit my job basically the next day and after being there for six weeks and started working for Dom. Um, and very quickly, we did have talent at that time. So Pixie Wu and Tanya Burr and Jim Chapman, Ruth Crilly. Um, it was a small Gloss collection. Makeup. Yes. Yeah, um, Gloss makeup. Gloss, uh, yeah. yeah. Sorry. <laughs> um, so, you know, they were there, but they actually weren't the mainstay of the business. And quite quickly, we switched to being totally focused on the talent because quite frankly, it was much more interesting mm -hmm. um, and nobody else was doing it. Um, we touched on the fact earlier that Liam Chivers was doing a similar thing with OP talent. With gaming. But with yeah. gaming. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and for that reason, Dom and Liam kind of did very separate things at the same time, just in slightly different industries. So how many years ago was this? Like, like when you first started? I started in 2012. 2012. Um, and the business was technically founded um, Feb 2010, so we've just had our 10-year birthday. Oh, wow. Yeah. Oh, that is amazing. So, like, why did you make the jump? I, I think, um, you know, this podcast is all about disruption. And um, how did you see what was going on and what made the big decision for you to actually make the jump and move and you'd be a part of this? Well, my mother was mortified that I was leaving a proper job to go work for this guy, <laughs> Tom, that she'd never, who was working in that office with right. one desk yeah. um so you know slightly skeptical because i think at that time nobody's parents understood this industry it's only now that this is so much of an industry it that so it's legitimized um so I, I just thought it was interesting i thought it was more interesting than what i was doing i wasn't particularly loving the job that i was in and i thought it's a bit of a punt but i think that there's something in this and i think it will grow um and it was it was so small at the time but it had potential, and that was exciting. Well, and if I remember correctly, um, both—I mean, I mean—Gleam ended up becoming one of the biggest management talent management companies 
in the UK. Yeah, I, I struggle to know now where we fit in the yeah. in the landscape because it's so diversified. So, yeah. it is. Yeah, and there's so many different types of businesses mm-hmm. managing talent as well. But we, I still say, we're probably the biggest just managing talent mm-hmm. um, rather than doing lots of other stuff. We have 50 talent in the UK um, and about 50 staff in the UK as well, which is an That's interesting amazing. business model. <laughs> well, no, that was, that was a, such a I mean, good entrepreneurial story. Mm. I mean, where you had zero experience managing talent. Dom had zero experience managing talent. I mean, even, but he, you know, he could send shampoo. Well, I mean, he was really good at sending <laughs> shampoo. Yeah, I mean, then, then you had, like Liam starting the gaming talent um, agency or a management company. And those were just two companies that just exploded without having the proper entertainment experience. Yeah. And but it's that, like that, that but just that's the whole happen. disruptive thing. Right. And I think the whole reason why is like there's all these opportunities out there and there's brands that are just doing the things that they need to do. And then other brands that see these opportunities say, hey, this is going to turn into something. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I, I just look back in that time. I, I started my agency in 99. But YouTube didn't actually start till 2005. But when I when I saw the first video on YouTube, I went to YouTube 2005 October. My jaw hit the ground, and I go, "This is going to be the future." Like this is the first time I watched video when you hit play that it didn't buffer all the way to the end before it starts playing. It could actually play, and you could actually embed these videos on websites. So I'm like, I, I'm going all in on this. Like I got super excited, and I had all these website design clients and SEO clients. I'm like, no, the video is the future. Like I, I truly do believe it. I, I so, took a different approach. I started a platform, and you're like, I want money. Like, We're going to combine MySpace, Facebook, and YouTube all in one. But, uh, how did we, that turn out for we you? We ended up getting sued. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we, we ended up pivoting. I'll tell that story in another podcast. That that will be a podcast, <laughs> guaranteed. <laughs> um, it was it was exploding at the time, but it, but no, like I remember. When I first, I mean, I, I've known about YouTube for a while, um, and I worked with influencers, you know, back, you know, to like, you know, two, 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 I mean, 2006, 2005. Um, but I remember the first time I noticed that the creator community started to grow and thrive. And I just remember seeing these teenage kids uploading very raw content and getting tens of thousands of views and sometimes hundreds of thousands of views. I remember just immediately like, okay, I got to try this. And I, I started doing tests with like uh, one of my friends that was living in, in my house with me uh, with his um, um, company, Aura Brush. And with Aura Brush and a couple other clients like Steripod and, and Travelo. They all um, lived in his house, by we, the way. No, no, no. <laughs> but, um, we, we just started experimenting across these creators and we're cr- crashing websites and seeing so much success. Um, when did you realize, Lucy, that you were, this was going to make it and you guys were going to be successful? Because you came in and you were a pioneer just like Dom. Um, and, and there must have been a lot of risk on the table because at that time, I remember being laughed at yeah. for being in this, you know, a part of this community. Yeah, and that, I think that's been one of our challenges over the years is well, right at the beginning is how very few people took it seriously and right. everything was so hard to get any deal done yep. was so hard except with Ricky Ray, who actually <laughs> was one of our very first clients. And mm-hmm. I'd Googled this morning that um, you, you've got a, a prior example of pix, working with Pixie Woo. But I remembered a Travelo Tanya Burr campaign from November 2011, which was even <laughs> pre-me um, being at Gleam. But um, you were one of the first people who recognized that this sold product as well. So, so there were few people who got it and we did amazing work with them, but the vast majority, it was hard. Um, and Dom, but who's Dom laughing and now, I, though, right? <laughs> and, and, and during that campaign, Dom and I probably were arguing over if it should be seven hundred dollars or twelve hundred dollars. Yeah, <laughs> well, well, today, I'd, pay, I'd pay those rates right now. Come on, <laughs> today the, the rates are much higher. A bargain. Yeah, um, yeah, definitely. But I think you talk about the Brit invasion in the U.S. So I do remember years of going to VidCon in Anaheim, yes. and we turned up with the the Brit crew, yeah, on mass. There was a load of us as well. And, yeah. We almost had matching T-shirts, like a level of enthusiasm and Britishness. And we came en masse and it was pandemonium. And it was moments like that where you're like, oh, wow, this is really something else. Um, so I think those moments. It, it, it's a big it's a big deal. And I like Ricky and I have been to every VidCon. We were at VidCon one and we've been to every VidCon. But when I get a new client that doesn't understand today's 
you know, ecosystem, especially with Gen Z. I'm like, okay, we're going to take a trip and we're going to go to Anaheim during VidCon. And then I want you to pay attention to what is actually happening. And we, we would, we'd, we'd go there and they're like, oh no, you know, we'll come for an hour or whatever. And they now witness like fandom, right? Yeah. And you get these screaming little teenage, you know, Gen Z girls that are just chasing around these YouTubers that probably have five followers, but they can, you know, whatever. But it's just, they, there's a lot of that dynamics. And then it really shows the influence that's actually happening today. Mm -hmm. And, you know, uh, back in my time, it was like, oh, Teen Beat or whatever, you'd have your magazines. Backstreet Boys. Backstreet Boys, you like that. Uh, right? oh, oh, no, no, you were more of like New Kids on the Block. New Kids on the Block was my jam. <laughs> no. That was more your era. It was like Iron Maiden, but anyway. <laughs> But no, Whatever. but it's like, it's like they, they could now get more, in, you know, intimate with these, with these creators yeah. because they're going into their lives. They're seeing what's happening, what's shared on social. And it just, it creates a, a super fan. Mm. And when I take my clients to this atmosphere, then they're able to click in their mind. Oh my gosh, the eyeballs of where they're going is like their industry is going to die off if they don't adjust to the new audience that's coming on. And this is where the new audience is. Yeah. And I, I look at it from all aspects, uh, but especially the the rising generation with TikToks, so I'm very, very sensitive to where their eyeballs go, you know? Mm -hmm. And right now it's it's TikTok. I mm -hmm. mean, 100% it's TikTok, you know, across the board. But let me actually- a viral trend within minutes. It, it really, it, it's it's truly interesting to see how that, I think it's a, what the essence of what YouTube was back mm -hmm. in the day. It's like, hey, we can create and we can share our stuff. And as the, the the platform matured with YouTube, you got more sophisticated, mm -hmm. um, you know, creators, yeah. and it just changed the fill. Mm -hmm. And now I believe that that sense of creation is happening on TikTok. Totally. And it's just taking off. Yeah, the same sort of quality levels are going on on both. And we have a mm -hmm. we have a talent on our roster called Lewis Ball who recently did a podcast where he referred to his content as a hot mess. He's like, it's not polished. It's not perfect. But, but people like want. it. That's, that's what, what they, they want. want. Yeah. And that's what I want to do as well. And that shift that happened through YouTube where it started as a hot mess and it got really polished is now yeah. being seen again on but TikTok. But the was always there. But, yeah. But yeah. I mean, the eyeballs were always there. And then, and, and it was, it, it took a huge learning curve for a lot of brands to realize like, okay, this doesn't need to look like a commercial. Mm. Like, this is where the loyal viewers are. We need to go and well, adopt the way I, that. I look at it from this way yeah. and like more so just because I like, I really feel like my skill set with audience development is really understanding the audience. But the younger generation coming up, they don't like long form content. They're not going to movies like they were, you know, 10 years ago or, or 20 years ago. Mm. But they, they are still binge watching Netflix, yeah, but they, which but is they interesting. Do. But it's, it's a little bit different because they want control mm. of what they watch, when they want to watch it, and how they want to watch it, yeah, right? So, so I'd say they want control. I wouldn't necessarily say they don't want long form. I mean, I think Shane Dawson's a perfect example oh, yeah. of I, long I, form. I, I, would, I would disagree. And the only reason mm. what I'm saying is, is like, I think the older, we're talking uh, younger millennials is more of a Shane Dawson crowd. Mm -hmm. The younger Gen Z, I guarantee you, are, like they, they would lose their attention and focus in, in the first 10 minutes. No, and I, I agree with that. And that was also the case with the young millennials when it came to Vine. They converted and grew up and started to do a lot more YouTube. And now they're watching a Logan Paul podcast. Yeah, I, I mean, they're watching long form content. So I think... Long form content still a part of the mix. I, I, it, the hype is around the short yeah, I, form. I, I, yeah, it'd be, as much it'd be as you interesting to can, see the data as on quickly that. as possible. Yeah, I think I'd lo love to see the data on that because I look at just how the micro content is really taking off in the industry, and mm -hmm. I'm I'm fascinated by it because it is literally you know you have ten seconds to a minute, and you're supposed to entertain them in that time before yeah. they swipe up mm -hmm. and. There is so much creativity going on, and you get sucked into the vortex of TikTok. Like I've been it's sucked dangerous. into that. It is, and you're oh, just yeah. like swiping up, and you just you realize just that ten going. hours just passed away, mm -hmm. but you're being entertained the whole time. And it, there's a sense of I, almost gamification yeah. to it because you're able to, to swipe, swipe. I mean, left, I would right. argue that this trend's been happening for the last ten years. I just YouTube think used to have a lot of short from content. I, I agree with Facebook, it, but, but Instagram. A lot of it evolved where they were pushing it away. It's like for a long time, sure. Whether we whether we like it or not, the algorithm was like favoring the stuff that can bring more watch time. Yes. That's not necessarily the case anymore because they go off, off of average view percentage. Sure, sure, sure. But I think it conditioned people to just, hey, I'm going to grab what it is. And if you do not validate what the what the title and thumbnail is for the video, I mean, they're gone. They're on mm. to the next video. No, absolutely. The, the challenge is making that sustainable as a career, though. And yeah. I think that, and that's what will be interesting with TikTok and how that develops is 
how can they will use will they them? learn the same mistakes of Vine? Because like, what? Why do you think I Vine think so. failed? I think I think they've already overcome those mistakes. Yeah, I mean, TikTok won't let TikTok fail. Yeah, I think, yeah. I think we all know that. Well, um, maybe maybe there'll, there'll be some government oversight or something. <laughs> <that'll make TikTok laughs> no fail. comment on that. <laughs> but no, I mean, I, I think it's a really exciting time because. Now we have a bigger variety of platforms, all doing video, all competing, and all doing very well. And I agree, Gen I, Z, TikTok is their platform, well, that's I, their jam. I, I think they're still and, on YouTube, and I think yeah, they're still they on are. Twitch, but right. I think the, the well, big thing is how- Younger than Gen Z is on YouTube. Like, like look at my daughter. Yeah. She watches like two hour videos of, you know, um, uh, the Peppa Pig. Yeah, the Peppa Pig crap, yeah, <laughs> like all that stuff. But there are also talent who have that age on YouTube. It is. Oh yeah, they are just playing with you know toys and stuff. Yeah, like there's a lot of interesting things happening. Lucy, what do you, where do you think things are going? Oh, that is such a big question. That is a question. From a, question, from a management it? perspective, um, I think the platform is platforms generally are becoming less dominant. So whereas you would have said we used to represent YouTubers, yeah. so people still think we represent YouTubers, which is something that <laughs> I struggle a little bit with because actually vast majority of our roster are probably more Instagram focused. Yeah. Um, but I think they're more platform agnostic. Um, and I think that our challenge is continuing, in the UK especially, is continuing to find good talent. It's quite a small pool here. So mm -hmm. there's a lot of very big talent or very successful talent. But, you know, finding those up and coming ones um, will be a challenge for any management team. Um, especially in this market. I know it's a little bit different in the US in terms of the I, sheer amount of talent. I'm just blown away. I mean, I've been on on YouTube since 2005 and I'm really integrated of seeing the top, come, you know, up, up, up and coming creators and stuff like that. Just, I really love trends. Mm. And it's every day I find someone new that I didn't even know existed and they have, you know, millions of subscribers and billions of views. I'm like, how is this even possible that I could find them? Yeah, our US teams, we have a team in LA as well. They think somebody with a million followers, they're like, yeah, that's okay. And I'm like, that's huge here. That's yeah, yeah. huge. In the UK, it's a big deal. Yeah. So that kind of discrepancy. I, I Finding talent in the US is hard it for is. different reasons. Now, Gleam has always had a unique approach in finding talent. You guys don't just represent anyone. I mean, you usually have a specific um, persona. I mean, um, that, that you guys target, like, yeah, for example. Spill your secrets here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, oh, 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 not secret, but a specific persona. Um, like, for example, you, you were some of the first that were representing vloggers. Yeah. And, and, and beauty um, channels. Well, we started in beauty because Dominic was consulting for beauty brands. And, and he that, had shampoo that he was saying And he had shampoo people. that he needed to get rid of. <laughs> so that's where it, it started in the beauty community. But quite quickly, that became beauty, fashion, lifestyle. Lifestyle led itself to vlogging. Yeah. And then we ended up with quite a um, kind of curated roster of vloggers and beauty, fashion, lifestyle content creators. That now is more diverse than it was then in terms of we represent travel talent, we represent food talent, um, we represent TikTokers and entertainment and sure. a, a little bit of everything, but it is probably still quite female skewed, mm -hmm. um, which I think is probably the thing that was true in 2010 and yeah. true now um, versus an OP talent who were skewing towards the men. Yes. Um, so, yeah. the, you know, there's a bit of discrepancy in both our rosters in that, in that sense, but we is do. There, is there a reason to, staying, you know, like, you know, with that demographic? It's just what or? we, it's just what we're good at. Yeah. And whenever I speak to a talent about p potential representation, I always say I wouldn't be here if I didn't think we could represent you well. I wouldn't take the meeting mm -hmm. if I didn't think we'd do a good job because I don't think it's worth risking our reputation. Um, and taking on a talent that we're going to do a rubbish job on. Yeah. That is where our skill set lies. So, you know, taking advantage of that is a good thing. But it doesn't mean we don't like to try things and experiment and it, and we can do a good job on other talent. It's just... So I got, a, I got a question because, like, you're dealing with a lot of brands and creators. And where do you see the highest conversions? Like, where what platform... Do you see it's easier to, to have the uh, call to action, whatever that may be, that click or whatever? What what platform and what medium is that? Uh, different for different talent. Sorry, that's not the answer you're probably looking for. But it would be a mix between Instagram story swipe up. When they brought mm -hmm. in the swipe up, that changed uh, everything. It was a game changer. Yeah. yeah, it was a game changer. And especially for those who are making good money from affiliate um, revenue. Yeah. Um, YouTube description boxes for the right talent still work brilliantly. And 
blogs probably for those who still have a really strong following on a blog, which is few and far between. And, you, yeah. and you're seeing you're seeing the same thing. I mean, like we've had this conversation before. Oh, yeah. Instagram stories is like just the easiest and, way. And, and so, I mean, I mean, in a way, you sort of need to work with every platform for different purposes. Yeah. So Instagram stories, immediate engagement. Yeah. YouTube, it's more long tail. It's also a great play for SEO. Um, I just I know creators love the stories because it it will die it will go off you yeah know? I mean they can save it if they want but it's just like a very temporary thing that the, will leave the click through rates if you do it yeah. right yeah like uh, are, are are the highest click through rates you can find online and I'd say the highest form of click through rates you could find in any form of advertising yeah IGTV will be interesting once the mm -hmm. retention rate grows, I think, um, on that surface because the ability to click out from there is nice. I, but, yeah, it'd be interesting. We actually had J John Yushai um, yeah. a couple months Ex ago. <laughs> exactly a year what, ago. It's been a year ago? Man, like time flies when we actually... He was here, was here in London when we interviewed yeah. him. Yeah. Was he with Instagram at that time? He just started. Okay, yeah. Okay. yeah. So I just had a conversation with him on, on the platform and uh, they have some amazing developments coming mm -hmm. just because... You know, they are putting, they're doubling down, tripling down on IGTV and there's a lot of capability. What I, what I really enjoy is it gives you that long form that's definitely needed when, when it's needed, yeah. you know, and it can do so much more. And there's a lot of things that are going to be happening there. I think, I think Instagram by far, I'd say TikToks I'm the most interested in, but I'd say the second would be Instagram with what they're doing with video is, you know. Or none. Yeah, and they're another one that they, that won't fail. They won't let that fail. Yeah. Um, obviously, it's yeah. Facebook owned, but it, well, it, yeah, it's, it's just like growing. They're owned, yeah, but they're not necessarily they're not mingled as much. No. <laughs> they don't mingle. <laughs> yeah, they don't mingle well. Um, okay, so you've dealt with creators, you've dealt with brands. What are some of the things that that you learned along the way <coughs> that can make a brand more effective when using influencers or creators? It's just about working with the right one. Mm -hmm. And I think so many brands see a name in shiny lights and they say, I want to work with that talent because they're the hottest thing right now. Um, and quite often that's not the right person for them. Just in terms of fit, um, in terms of the talent actually liking that brand, um, the content that they make, the audience wanting that brand in that right. content, it, it's all about selection. And I personally don't think that brands spend enough time thinking about selection. We get a lot of inbound inquiries saying, we want to work with influencers, <coughs> help. Yeah. And then we have to coach them through, okay, well, who do you want to talk to? And, you know, go through that process with them. But they'd rather not do that research themselves necessarily. I mean, there are some that, yeah. you know, know really well what they're doing and who they're after and what works for them. But they're still learning. And have you ever looked outside of your pool? Like when, when a brand comes to and approaches you and say, hey... You know, this is what we're looking for. You don't necessarily have it in your pool. Do you go out and find new talent that would be more conducive to that campaign? Yeah. So we um, launched a consultancy called Gleam Solutions last year, which was designed to do that because our roster is tiny still. 50 is, I mean, it's big in terms of yeah. the UK market, but 50 talent aren't able to fulfill right, all exactly. briefs. Um, and we increasingly, we're getting requests from brands for that guidance and how, you know, how can we navigate it? And if we're Shiseido and we want five Chinese influencers, mm -hmm. where can we find them? And, you know, we're able to help them navigate that. So we do if, if that's necessary. And how do you navigate? Like, how do you find them? Like, what's the process? Do you have your internal software that's finding people? Or? Yeah, so we have a proprietary tool in-house that, sort of does this. Do tell. Do tell. We like, we like the data, the data software. But it doesn't. Proprietary. That means proprietary. It doesn't. Um, we can pull, basically pull together a short list okay. based, based on data. Um, but then apply um, a human touch of, are they the right brand fit? That's Have the vaguest thing I've ever heard. I know. But it sounds so Do you good. know what? It's vague and it's long. <laughs> yeah. Um, no, no I, can, I can only imagine because there's so much content that's yeah. out there. Yeah. And there's so many different creators and just finding the right mix. Yeah. And we won't, we won't have you disclose secrets by, sure. you know, by no means. So, um, What three talent that you guys represent do you think are the, the growing the fastest right now? That's like a loaded question. It's like, hey, who's your favorite no, child? Yeah, no, 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 no,
So we represent Mrs. Hinch, who is a very UK talent, but she went from um, a from basically a thousand to a million followers in about six months. Wow. Um, maybe 18 months ago. That's uh, amazing. Yeah, and her topic of choice. So A, she grew via Instagram stories, and I think she was the first person in the UK who really used stories as their mm. method of growth. Um, and um, she talks about hinching, which means cleaning, um, organizing the home, order within the home. Huh. Um, so she was also, so she was quite like, unique. That's a, that's a, that's a trend right now. for the UK. There yeah, we go. But, but she's very British in yeah. terms of uh, her personality as well. So she, she just grew enormously quickly. And I think a lot of that was around word of mouth as well, because everybody in our office, everybody's like, have you heard of Mrs. Hinch? Um, <laughs> and she just grew so, so quickly and she's still growing. Um, we have quite a few uh, Gen Z talent who are growing quite quickly proportionally for their size because of the really high engagement. So they've got, you know, 10% engagement. They're the growing. The Gen Z creators wow. are amazing mm -hmm. just because they get it. They get it. They've well, they lived on it. Watching. They grew up on it and they're like, yeah. oh, this is what I want to be or this is what I want to do. A, it's a career. It is. Mm -hmm. and, and they just know how to connect like no other. I, I've just been impressed with that generation, that rising generation for content creation. I think it's going to be very interesting in the next you know, five, 10 years. It'll be a different world. That's really the thing will. that's interesting about this space. I always say I left every job after a year and a half and I've been here, it's my eighth year. And I'm like, it's just because every six months it's it different. Changes. It's so, oh, yeah. keeping on top of it is yeah, hard like work. 20 jobs. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And it's, yeah, it's not what it was then and it's moving quickly. So where do you see it going then? I mean, if you've been around in the industry for a while. Where do you see the next iteration of, of the development of, the influencer and brand space? Um, I hope to see more uh, more of all of it in terms of, I, I think if you're in the industry, and especially if you've been in the industry as long as we all have, you think, wow, hasn't it come so far? But if you take a step back, I feel like there's still, still the beginning. It's, it's just, still the beginning. It really is. There's so much more to go, whether that's in terms of brands understanding, more talent, more platforms, changes to platforms that really shift things. I, I have no idea what it will look like in five years' time. I used to pretend that I knew what it would look like, right. but I've given in. It's yeah. too hard. It, it'll be interesting. I think it's. Um, I think TikTok has a long future. Uh, well, the TikTok type of uh, content, I think, yeah. has a lot of future. And I think there will be other platforms that adopt it. And then Facebook and everybody else will just copy whatever mm -hmm. is out there. You know, um, I think there's going to be more Chinese platforms that start crushing it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I I would agree with that as well. Um, it'll be very interesting the dynamic of how it how it evolves in the next five ten years. But I do think that the level of the creator has leveled up completely. Mm -hmm. um, I see people like uh, one of my uh, main clients is Mr. Beast, and I, I can tell you that there is no creator out there that's more concerned with data that I've ever seen before. And he makes data driven decisions, and there's no reason why he, you know he doesn't have you know, a half a billion video views in every month. Yeah. You know, it's just, he's very analytical when it comes to that and he gets it. I think so many talent are now and those are the mm -hmm. ones that are managing to spot trends that benefit them. But I do think that it then causes problems. I had a conversation last weekend with Jim Chapman, who yeah. you will remember, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, because he put up a really great shot of him talking to David Gandhi at London Fashion Week on stage. He was interviewing David and um, put it on his stories. And I was like, Jim, put that on your grid. And he was like, no, it won't get enough likes. I was like, that is completely beside the point. <laughs> Put it on your grid because it, that is what you're about. You're in fashion and you're interviewing David Candy. That's really cool. Um, and he did eventually, but really resisted because he was worried about likes. And I think Instagram removing likes will be really interesting. It, they they removed it and they put it back. I mean... <laughs> I still got likes, so yeah, I, I it's, hard likes to, too. it's hard to see. Really? It went away for a little bit. I don't know if it's just no, a beta it, group. It's, it's a beta group. Yeah. yeah. But it, yeah, it went away. I'm like, hey, this would be interesting to see how they leverage this, but then it came back. Well, well creators were very frustrated by it. I, I, I've spoken to a variety of creators where they said, now we can't learn from other creators. Like, I mean, just be able to see, like, what's going on and what's getting engaged. No, they're saying that we can't copy other yeah. creators. Well, That's I mean, like, they, learning no, a comparison no, no. are different things. I, 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 dis, I disagree. Like, talk about being data-driven. Being able to see what else is going on is so important. Oh, I, you don't have to tell me. Like, I'm well, the last honestly, person. In, you're so emotional, Daryl. I, I am emotional, but let me tell you. <laughs> no, I, I'm sorry, the, guys. The research, he always gets angry with me. 
It, it's true because he like eats all my food. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just joking. But no, at the end of the day, it's like there is a lot of research there and there's other tools that are out there. Mm -hmm. And I think that's something that each platform needs to do. How can you compare to what's actually happening? Tick, TikTok's data Ex needs work. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. And there's That'll some, be interesting. Yeah, there is some interesting websites out there that gives you a lot of data of what's trending on TikTok mm. and all that stuff. But it's you just choose that platform wisely. Is that what it is? Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, there, there, there's other things out there, but the credibility. Oh, of course. Well, I'm waiting for you to release your AI so I can have that, but it's not public. Sure. <laughs> so. Nope. Well, um, so tell us, tell us, like, um, like, what are some of the hurdles that you see in the next couple couple years for both brands and creators in the space? Um. Uh, talking about data, funnily enough, I think recently we've seen too much of a focus from brands on data to the point where it's at the detriment of the content. Yeah. So whether that's um, uh, because, because the data is there and the data is important and it is useful and it has to be from an ROI perspective. I feel like all of the attention went onto that and mm -hmm. we didn't worry about what the content looked like. Yeah. And actually... Content is what made all of these platforms exist there, in the first there's place. There's something that's missing. And what's missing is, is being data-driven needs to happen, but you have to also have data-driven systems and processes. And I think that's what gets missed. Sometimes people are following data and they're trying to be very calculated. But the truth is, you know, if you have a system and process that works, I mean, you need to follow that system and process. Like, for example, you know, the brand should know their limitations when it comes to the creative. They should know, okay, what they need to do to empower the influencer. Then the influencer then comes up with the creative recommendations because they know how to speak to their creatively audience. to their audience better than anyone else. Mm. And then from there, you know, if you do that right, you will have higher click-through rates. You'll have higher conversions, also higher views, and potentially see more anomalies of, of content performing even better. You will learn as well. That's yeah, the thing. Yeah. You learn. Otherwise, you don't learn anything if you just focus on that. I, What's that process that's called, Daryl? What, what process is, is that? that? I just mentioned? Is it the triangle of everything? No, it's called the consensus triangle. The, the, yes. the triangle that you've been talking the, about the for brand, years. <laughs> the brand, the creator, and the audience all reach a consensus. Yeah. And then everyone's happy. It with, just sounds complicated with, to me. No, no, it is not complicated. It's so you're simple. Every, Beautifully every, simple. You're just, you're every just, triangle. You're just a simple guy. A there, redneck. There, you know? there is some truth. <laughs> but 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 it's, it's one of those things where this is the first time in the history of advertising or the history of the planet where the brand, the content creator, and the audience are all happy. Yeah. And and it, and and it's because you have to follow a process that benefits them all. But I, I think a lot of brands make a huge mistake because they don't allow the creator to create, right? Yes. And they can just put their toe in the water, like, okay, what does this amount of money do for us? And let's track it. That's the data that they need to analyze. Mm -hmm. It's like, hey, if we take a, a non-aggressive approach with this creator, what can they create? You know, and what does that look like? And but then it, tracking but also, this it also comes to alignment. For example, you know, we can look at 50 creators and think, okay, all these creators are going to do a really good job, you know, in you know driving clicks or conversions. However, with our history of doing campaigns and our data-driven systems and processes, we know you only prioritize the creators that are going to be the most passionate. Mm. Why? Higher conversions, exactly. higher clicks. Exactly. It doesn't matter. I mean, who has maybe a more optimal? I mean. I mean you're, you're targeting a, def, I mean, a specific demographic, et cetera, or geographic area, but it really comes down to the preference of the creator and if they're passionate or not. If you don't gauge those passion levels, um, there's, a, there's a good chance you're going to fail, even if you're targeting the right data. Any, yeah. any brand that is involving a creator in the process of almost creating the brief, mm -hmm. I think will win because they are creatives and they have mm -hmm. ideas and they know what works and what doesn't work. And also they've worked with a load of brands before and seen what did and didn't work. Yeah. They've, they've learned as well. Um, so utilizing them in that way, whether that's as consultants, we're seeing a lot more consultancy um, happening. So brands requesting that a creator gets involved in very early stage, not even a content brief, but a, yeah, a new product a development. development. Of, exactly. Or marketing, whatever it might be, because that's who they want to, talk to, the audience is who they want to talk to. The next phase, I mean, right now, I, I really do feel budgets and, and media are pivoting over to spending 
you know, more and more on influencer rather than commercials. Um, I think the next phase or the next wave of this is literally having these creators or these creatives um, start to take money from creative agencies. Yeah, you've got a one-man band in many creators. We've got some mm -hmm. on our roster who's, product, they are literally a one-man production company. The, the level of content quality is so high. You look at the Instagram posts. Yeah. It, it's, it's, it's better photography than what you can get at most agencies. Exactly. And mm -hmm. actually much cheaper. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, you know, it might not feel cheap, but for what you're getting. Mm -hmm. And also brands repurposing content. I feel like not enough of that happens. If, if you've got a really gorgeous piece of content from a creator that is authentic and credible and connects with people, licensing it and using it in different ways, I, I don't think enough brands do that. Yeah. I, it'll be interesting to see. I, I, I'm very interested to see if the, uh, you know, the older money in media is going to transfer over. I know that you see more of that just in yeah. the nature of your business, but um, every I, year we see brands. I, I'm just, I'm, I'm blown away at just the viewership of television and these shows. And it's a fraction of some of these creators that they do in a given week, you know, well, and well, it's, when you look at Mr. Beast, it's easy to compare him to a specific TV show, but what you should be comparing him to is a TV network. Yeah. Because that's the type of volume that he's bringing in. And that's the case with also Zach King mm. and a variety of other um, creators that are out there. Like, they're literally creating media empires. And, and um, people know and brands know that they have to work with creators. Um, it's just them giving up the emotional connection they have with TV. Yeah. There is that, that withdrawal, though. Yeah, I because mean, I can't, I, if you're data-driven, you're going to find a hell lot better resor results being inside the content and specifically inside um, digital content. Yeah, and I, I look at it from this way is what can you really track on TV and radio, right? And mm -hmm. you can track every aspect of the campaign well, if you want to. And another online. issue to look at is 65% of, I mean, well, specifically across the planet and the globe, 47%, and I'd say in developed countries, it's over 50% of um, people are using ad blocking technology. In just the US alone, 65% of people watching television have an ad blocking strategy or, or technology that they're using. And, and so when you're inside the content, which you know, or creator mm -hmm. content, you have not just someone that sees you, which is a huge step up. <laughs> Because, like, you know, you can actually guarantee who right. sees you. It's someone that loves the content. Yeah. And they'll watch. And they'll watch, would, it. They'll watch it. And engage. They will. They and will. React. I would say, though, that there are, I feel like there are some brands who they should stick to TV. I don't think it's for everybody. <laughs> okay, Maybe name, name the list here. Hey, hey, hey. Go ahead, I, I disagree. And I think there's, there's a bias here because you represent 50 talent. Yes. <laughs> um, but I do no, I just, I think that TV isn't going away. I think. We are seeing spend divert in this direction, but well, it no, doesn't. TV, TV will, will be around, but it will, it will be a different animal. Yeah, because you evolve. have to look at, like, for example, Netflix um, is, is bigger than all of the top three um, um, TV networks combined. I mean, TV is definitely diminishing, but it's reforming into streaming platforms. Yes, yeah, this Yeah, yeah. I, 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 I'm excited. I'm excited to see where it goes, and I'm excited to see the way that uh, we can reach. The world. I mean, a lot of these campaigns, I mean, when you're doing campaigns before, you'd have to be, you know, on certain television stations. And if you wanted to go bigger, it's going to cost a lot more money. Now you can reach the world just with the right influencer mm -hmm. and you can hit the markets that you couldn't even dream about being in. That's where it's really fascinating because I believe that you can get higher conversions when you think global and not local. And it's just... And, and again, this sounds funny. And this is going back to, you know, you're kind of saying, maybe there's some things that can stay on TV. If you think about, like, all the jazz musicians that have an engaged audience, like on Facebook, or, you know, all these bands, or, like, let's say Ringo Starr, you know, he has a pretty loyal audience, or Paul McCartney. Like, there's ways of targeting all demographics. Yeah. Like, it, I mean, it is so big now. If you look at all the different communities on Facebook, as well as on Instagram, which has become a, a much older audience pretty quickly. Like there is seriously so much from Gen Z up to the baby boomers. This is, this is the other thing, is a misconception that influencing is 
for the youth yeah. and the audience is the youth. We mm-hmm. have we have creators on our books in their 50s yeah. who are making amazing content for women in their 50s. It's it's not about the youth. Rogaine should be targeting the gaming community because that is <laughs> where, did, where no, did no, that no, come from? No, no, no. <laughs> I, Wasn't I, that just I, 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 I was looking at the back of your head. So, so this is the thing. Like, like oh, Rogaine is, you know, one of those things where you think it's just an older demographic, but really they're targeting men 30 plus. Because they're wearing a the big, headsets. And a big, big, okay, no, got it. no. A big chunk of, of, you know, men that are, you know, Gen X or um, older millennials, they're in the gaming community. Yeah. Like, I mean, a huge, I mean, there's gaming companies that are coming to us now saying, we don't know how to get a younger demographic than 30 plus. And, 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 and they're now trying to figure out how to target younger gamers. Um, there's just so many huge communities that brands that are not involved are just missing mm. when like, it's just right under their nose. The challenge there is how do you get that into the content? Or oh, do, you just, do you just run easy. pre-roll? <laughs> There's a lot of shameless gamers. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> well, I think that's it. That's all we got. <laughs> but well, do, 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 our, um, do our plug for Rogan. Is that what it is? <laughs> yeah. Oh, this is hey, the whole time this has been an ad. Please sponsor Ricky. He's sick of his toupee. <laughs> You know, no. my beard too bad. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's awesome. He just makes it out of his back hair. So anyway, <laughs> yeah, I love you, man. Okay. All right. So um, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, one last question. And we ask everyone, you just flinched when yeah. I said one last question. Um, where do you see, I know we kind of talked about this a little bit, but where do you, what are you the most excited about? And where do you see a lot of disruption happening in the industry? I am genuinely excited about Instagram removing likes. Mm. Um, I, I get asked it all the time um, because it's a controversial topic at the moment, but I think that it will change things for creators, which is the bit that I care right. the most about. And mm. I think it will change the way brands work. I think it will make them uh, work harder in terms of the data side so of things. So less bots. <laughs> Perhaps. And more humans. Yeah. Um, uh, I think that um, we. the other interesting thing is around um, – accountability online um, in terms of recent press in the UK. Um, And um, it will be interesting to see how platforms respond to that in terms of sort of online safety, because I think they've done stuff already. And I think that will probably take another step up in the near future. Um, And other than that, on our roster, just very excited about lots of top secret things I could never talk about. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> so she's like yeah we have a lot of stuff going on but we can't uh, tell you soon <laughs> soon <laughs> we'll do our mutual NDA and we'll, yeah, we'll, we'll share go we'll gossip we'll get a coffee <laughs> well, well thank you so much for joining thank and you Lucy thanks so everyone much. for watching this podcast thanks, make sure you like and subscribe and we'll see you on the next video